so that we can go on with the last presentation from this session on mechanism of gut microbiota impact on host physiology. And it's really a great, great pleasure just to introduce the last speaker of this session, who is Professor Frederick Beckett, who is the director of the Wallenberg Laboratory at Alexandrinska Center for Cardiovascular and Metabolic Research. And he's professor at the University of Gothenburg here in Sweden, but he is also in the meantime so professor at the University of Copenhagen and Oslo. But it doesn't mean that it is only in the northern countries that his reputation is going up. And so for sure, Frederick Backett was one of the first one upon his postdoc uh, just to study the interest of the germ-free mice. Maybe we will discuss about that, just to evaluate the role of the gut microbiota in obesity. And back to Sweden for sure, so his group really gained a lot of reputation and excellent papers and outcomes. And so it's my pleasure, Frederick, just to let you the floor, just to present the link between the gut microbiota and type 2 diabetes. Thank you, Natalie. Uh that introduction and uh, thank you Inger and the committee here at the Royal Academy for, for or organizing this day and for letting me for speak here. Uh, so we're right after, uh, after lunch and uh, as you probably know and is that there's a lot of factors affecting our microbiota and by the way I'm one of the good things by me being late is that I don't have to give the general introduction so I can move more straight into to what I would like to present here today. But it's that a lot of factors changes the microbiota and thus the metagenome or the microbiome that really can contribute to different diseases where the major focus have been on inflammatory diseases like inflammatory bowel diseases and metabolic diseases. Uh, Ted presented about the brain, I think that's really important, but I think there's still much more to be done in that space. Um, also due to, to animal models, which I think is really important. And I should make that remark probably here that I think that I, I agree and I disagree with Ted's comment about the germ free mice. I think they are really good models for certain diseases and lousy models for other diseases. It depends on what you look at. I think for metabolic diseases, they're generally better. If you take a human microbiota and put it into a mouse, the metabolic gene repertoire is relatively sim sim similar between mouse microbes and human microbes. But if you take a look at the inflammatory and immune cascades, they're very different if you have a human or mouse microbiota. The mouse microbiota induces it, and the human microbiota doesn't really do much on immune regulation in a mouse. But our focus is on metabolic diseases and diet. I was going to highlight one slide here from Robert's posters out there, where we have been interested in how different diets can shift the microbiota, uh, such as if you have fat, the fat sources from, from, from lard or from fish oil, they have a different, the mice that are fed these di diets have different microbiota composition. This mouse is protected against, met uh, induces metabolic dysfunction. This mouse is protected against metabolic dysfunction. And by transferring the microbiota from this protective microbiota to the uh, vulnerable microbiota, we can actually protect uh, against large induced metabolic uh, dysfunction. But I'm sure you had a chance to look at that poster. If not, it may be up here also in the coffee break, and Robert is here in the audience that can guide you through it. But a common phenomenon when you have a diet rich in, in, in lard and, and sugar is that you, you have a less diverse microbiota. And I think that's the common theme if you look at the studies that have looked at the microbiota and obesity, for example, is that the microbiota of the obese individuals has a less reduced diversity compared to the lean individuals. And it's still an open question, I think, whether this reduced diversity of microbiota contributes to disease or just reflects the obesity, perhaps because of a different diet. So there's a lot to be done there, and I, I discussed with Li Ping uh, just before, before this talk uh, how about the importance of trying to align the food questionnaires, for example. So we have the same food questionnaires in these different studies, so we can compare across studies and not just saying, like, in this study, we have this res result, and in this study, we have this res result, and we don't know if it's a true result or if it's just more methodological. Um, but I think we're getting better and better, and I start to be an emerging uh, <laughs> view on, on how, how, how the microbes may contribute to obesity and other diseases. In my lab, we're not that interested in, in, in obesity. I think still that if you eat a lot of calories and you expend less calories, you will develop obesity. 
But it's not the fact that obesity kills you, it's really the diseases that follows obesity that kills you, such as type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. And about 40% of the obese individuals will go on and develop uh, type 2 diabetes, but 60% does not. So does this mean that the microbiota may be important in deciding who will develop type 2 diabetes or not? And, but as more and more of us get, get obese, there's an increased incidence of type 2 diabetes. And in some areas of the world, you are estimated to have more than 20% of the population having type 2 diabetes in 10 years from now. So it is, a, it is a major burden for society and for the individuals. Uh, I'm going to try to, to just give one background on type 2 diabetes. I, it's dangerous to do when you have physicians in the audience here, but the way I, I, I view it and I think it's true is that if you are normal glucose tolerant, you have uh, low plasma glucose and you can maintain that with relatively low plasma insulin and you have a high insulin sensitivity. Then you have this pre-diabetic phase, which Max also alluded to, is where you probably can do the interventions, where you actually start to reduce the insulin sensitivity, but you can compensate it by producing a lot of insulin, which can still maintain a relatively low glucose, uh, fasting blood glucose. So in this space here, you may have a good opportunity to, to intervene, whereas if you get further to this point, where you eventually you exhaust the beta cells, the insulin production goes down, you have low insulin sensitivity, and the blood glucose goes up, and you have full-blown diabetes. This is con a continuum, and the values that clinicians use are sort of, you know, you say if you have 6.8, you're here, if you have 7.0, you're here, but it doesn't really change much for that patient, to be honest, I think. So, does the microbiota, is, my, is the, the microbiota affected in patients with type 2 diabetes? Uh, I think there's now three metagenome studies, so microbiome studies, be performed by shotgun sequencing, where we not only look at taxonomy by looking at with bacteria that are there, but also at the functions. We published one of those. Uh, there was one published uh, by, by BGI and Olaf Pedersen's groups, and one which was published by, um, uh, recently by also by Olaf Pedersen's group. And what's nice here, compared to the obesity study, is that we are basically finding the same things. Also between uh, the two Europeans are very similar and uh, some similarities also with the Chinese study. And we don't think that's method a lot, that the, met the methods really differs here. But there's actually uh, some, some population-based differences between Chinese and Swedes. But what is a common phenomenon is that in the healthy, normal glucose tolerant individuals, you have a lot of butyrate producing bacteria. And in the type 2 diabetics, you actually have a lot of lactobacillus. We don't know why you have a lot of lactobacillus there, and we don't know if it actually contributes to disease, but that's, this is the sort of the phenotype that we can see among, across studies. So the consensus that's that butyrate-producing bacteria are reduced in patients with type 2 diabetes, and work from Max's lab, that I, unfortunately I missed the first part of his talk, so I don't know if he pre presented this data, is that if you use vancomycin that reduces the amount of butyrate-producing bacteria, you actually reduce the insulin sensitivity, but if you use an antibiotic that affects the gram-negative bacteria, you don't see that. So this at least tells you that there may be some causal relationship in humans that butyrate-producing bacteria can protect against uh, insulin resistance. What we also did in our study was that we, based on the microbiome, were able to make an algorithm that could classify those that have type 2 diabetes and those that were healthy. And I don't think this will ever be clinical relevant because it's a very expensive way of telling you if you're diseased or not. So, but what it will potentially help us to do is if we can start to predict if the changes in the microbiome would precede disease onset. So would this mean that we could take a population, say the people in here, and say that about 5% or so of us, maybe a little bit more, would go on and develop type 2 diabetes. 40% maybe have some impairment of insulin resistance. Can we identify those individuals? And then, as type 2 diabetes is not one disease, it's a lot of ways we can become insulin resistant or develop type 2 diabetes. Can we then 
identify them based on the microbiota, and then tailor different interventions or, or preventions to make them avoid, uh, to prevent them from developing disease. And this could be probiotic supplements, and we heard a little bit about that from both Ted's and, and Max's talks. We will hear much more about different diets. Uh, probably exercise is probably always good for you. But could the microbiome also tell you what drug you should be on? Who would be benefit from metformin? Who would have side effects from metformin, for example? And the same thing with bariatric surgery. But in order to understand this, I think we really need to go into these germ-free mouse models and to, to learn how does the microbiota affect signaling. And at least it's a good thing, it's a sledgehammer, it tells you if we don't see a difference between the from the germ-free and the colonized mice, it's probably not the microbial interference. But if there is a difference, we need to figure out how and why. And we use this system where we have mice that are born and raised in the absence of uh, bacteria in these plastic bubbles. And we analyzed their body composition, and we did this in uh, both as a, when I was a postdoc with Jeff Gordon, and Robert did this in a, in a publication now four years ago, uh, and we get the same result. Basically, that the germ-free mice have very low body fat compared to conventional raised mice. And if you recolonize these mice after, for just two weeks, you would normalize the amount of body fat. So that's, at least in mice, there's a strong causal relationship between body fat and, and uh, microbiota. What about glucose metabolism? Well, as you would expect, and this is work from uh, Luis Manuel's Holm that's presented here, um, you have a leaner uh, germ-free mouse, and that has a reduced fasting blood glucose, reduced fasting insulin, and if you calculate the HOMA index, which you use in, in the clinic, on how insulin sensitive you are, the germ-free mice ha have uh, uh, reduced insulin resistance compared to the conventional raised mice. And we can also show that by injecting in, uh, glucose into the interperitoneum of the mice and measure how fast glucose is cleared, it's cleared faster in the germ-free mice than the conventional raised mice. But Louis said that, well, we should really do an insulin clamp to decide whether there is a difference in insulin sensitivity. And the way uh, Louise did this is that she chose body weight matched animals. So there was no difference in body weight because she was afraid that that would really skew the data. And then she performed a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp, which was a lot of technology development because she has to do a surgery in the germ-free germ mice and maintain them sterile for four days. So we can infuse uh, insulin uh, at a fa fixed rate and then measure how much glucose do we have to infuse to maintain their euglycemic uh, condition. And the glucose infusion was much higher in the germ-free mice compared to the conventional raised mice, suggesting that the germ-free mice have an increased insulin sensitivity. And what Louise then found was that there's, there's a, the germ-free mice have an inc uh, increased insulin sensitivity in both the periphery, so probably muscle and, and adipose tissue, as well as it's, it's uh, a stronger suppression of the hepatic glucose production by, by measuring that. So what we have found over the past decade or so is that the microbiota can regulate metabolism by affecting basically any organ system we look into, uh, including the brain, where what we are interested in how they regulate satiety. We know that it affects uh, inflammation and, and lipogenesis in the liver, uh, how much lipids we have and how much inflammation we have in the adipose tissue, how much fat we burn in the skeletal muscle, and also, it has direct effects in the epithelium, where it affects uh, enterendocrine cells, for example. But what are the evidence, and I'm just going to present two stories on how the altered microbiota may contribute to metabolism in humans. So I will give you two examples. And one, the first one is how, how the microbiota can, uh, is regulated by bariatric surgery and how the bariatric surgery may be mediated through the micro, so, uh, effects through the microbiota. And this is a story uh, developed by Valentina Tremaroli. So what we did was that we had the opportunity to collaborate with uh, uh, surgeons at uh, that, uh, the Solgenska Hospital, uh, Tosin Olbers, Molin Valling, and also Carol LaRue was involved in this study, where we got fecal samples from patients that underwent ruin y gastric bypass uh, almost 10 years earlier, or vertical banding, 
and we matched them so that they had lost the same amount of body weight and fat mass. So we took basically the best of the vertical banding procedures and the worst of the room y gastric bypass procedures. And how these procedures work is that in the room y gastric bypass, you take the stomach, you make it uh, about the size of a thumb, and then you bypass the rest of the stomach and the upper small intestine and connect the duodenum straight to the stomach. So unprocessed food goes straight into the stomach, uh, to the intestine here. And in the vertical banding, you basically just band off, so you shrink the stomach. Both of them have been used. This was the first version. This is a, a later version of the surgeries. This is more efficient in terms of maintaining a lower body weight and re uh, reverting insulin uh, or diabetes. We also had some, some normal controls that were obese. And what we found was that, that the taxonomy changed. So we did shotgun sequencing, and we plotted then uh, the relative m uh, abundance and the obese controls versus the room y gastric bypass, and we found that a bunch of bacteria were more prevalent in, in the room y gastric bypass patients. And these were mainly bacteria belonging to the proteobacteria, such as Escherichia coli. If we took the vertical banding instead to the obese uh, individuals, we didn't see any significant changes, which are indicated here with the colors, but we saw a similar trend. We also looked for functions, and we see that the Roman gastric bypass had a lot, uh, affected more genes than the vertical banding, but they still both affected a lot of genes. Most genes seem to be more, pref uh, more abundant in, in, the Roman in the surgery patients compared to the beast controls. And we found that some of the genes that were upregulated were specific for the surgery, such as vertical banding or Renoir gastric bypass. But we also found a common set of functions that were upregulated after both surgeries. So this is interesting to us that there is an altered microbiota after basic surgery, that my altered microbiota seems to encode different functions. But does it mean anything? Does it contribute to the weight loss? So what we did was that we transferred then the microbiota from the obese controls or from the surgery patients into germ-free mice, and we analyzed the amount of body fat they had two weeks later. And what Valentina found was that if you took two donors and put them into four or five mice, and then you measured the amount of increase in fat gain, you saw that the ones that got the obese microbiota, they gained more body fat compared to those that had ruined y gastric bypass microbiota, and the vertical banding came some, somewhere in between. At least to us, it suggests that the altered microbiota may actually contribute on how much body fat these uh, individuals may have. But what about causality? So what does bariatric surgery, does it really require a microbiota to have its benefits? So this is work that we had developed together with Randy Seeley and uh, Jose Berger from, from uh, the University of Cincinnati at the time, now that's the University of Michigan. And in mice, in germ from mice, we can't do a room y gastric bypass because it's a very complicated surgery and we need to maintain the mice sterile. So what we instead did was that we developed a vertical sleeve gastrectomy, which is a very popular way of bariatric surgery today. And instead of replumb the, the intestine, you basically cut away a large portion of the stomach along the greater curvature here. So you reduce it to a sleeve. So that's why it's called vertical sleeve gastrectomy. The follow-ups are not as long as for Y gastric bypass, so if you followed up for about five, three to five years right now, and it appears as vertical sleeve gastrectomy, although it looks very different from Ruin Y gastric bypass, has quite similar functions, similar output in terms of weight loss and, and remission of diabetes. So we then performed the surgeries in germ-free colonized mice, and this is the data, that in mice that have a microbiota, you have a very nice reduction in body weight, that is significantly different at all time points. If you instead do it in germ-free mice, you do see an initial drop in body weight, but it's getting closer and closer. So after six weeks, it's actually uh, borderline significant. What we see here uh, in fasting blood glucose is that if you do the vertical sleeve gastrectomy in a colonized mouse, you have reduced fasting blood glucose compared to the sham control mice. 
And if you do the uh, interpret, uh, this is an oral glucose tolerance test. You can see that the germ free, uh, that the surgery mice have an improved glucose tolerance compared to those that have colonized. In contrast, if you do the same thing in germ free mice, there's no significant difference in the glucose uh, uh, signaling. So it really looks like that you need a microbiota to see the benefits of vertical sleeve gastrectomy. What about the mechanisms? The lab is, uh, we are a little bit of a bile acid philic. So we like bile acids in the lab. So we know from the literature and we know from our own work that bariatric surgery in, induces how you have high levels of, of bile acids. And this is data from, from the humans presented before that in room Y gastric bypass subjects, they have uh, trend to have higher levels of fasting, blood uh, fasting bile acids, total bile acids. And after a meal, it really sh uh, skyrockets. Whereas if you have vertical banding, it's sort of a little bit changed. And if you are obese control, you, nothing happens with your bile acids upon a meal challenge. And this is both for uh, primary and secondary bile acids. Unfortunately, we didn't have so many individuals uh, due to that we really wanted to match them on BMI and wait for, have 10 year follow ups. But we do see is a trend is that the microbiota in Rowan Y gastric bypass patients they have increased abundance of genes, the bi genes, which are required for, for, for producing secondary bile acids. So we think there is a connection between the bariatric surgery, the microbiota, and bile acid production. So once again, this is data from MaxLab. And I showed you this part before where you had vancomycin treatment of, of patients with metabolic syndrome and you have a reduced insulin sensitivity. And that reduced insulin sensitivity is accompanied by a reduction in secondary bile acids in the feces. And if you do amoxicillin, which does not really target the, the bile acid metabolizing bacteria, you don't see that drop. So are bile acids important? Well, they signal through a receptor called Farnside uh, X receptor, which is predominantly expressed in the intestine in the liver. It's a nuclear receptor and it's known to modulate lipid and glucose metabolism. So in collaboration with Randy Seeley again, we used the vertical sleeve gastrectomy model. And in this case, what Randy and his team did, uh, led by Karen Ryan, was that they performed vertical sleeve gastrectomy in wild type and FXR knockout mice. And as you can see here in the wild type mice, you see that the VSG mice, they lose weight after surgery, whereas the CHAM mice actually gain weight because these were fed a high fat diet. But if you do the same surgery in the knockout animals, you see an initial weight loss, but then it's completely abolished. And what was interesting here was that we noted that the, the vertical sleeve gastrectomy actually increased the abundance of a bacteria called Rosaburia. And this is one of the good guys. You usually see Rosaburia being high in, in metabolically healthy individuals. So I will switch gear for the final part of, of the talk. And, and discuss a little bit about how diet can affect the microbiota and how that may, the microbiota by diet effect may be very important in terms of regulating glucose homeostasis. The study was led by Petya Kovacheva, and this was a very close collaboration with uh, Inge Björk, who is organizing today's seminar, and Anne Nilsson is also here. And what we did is that in Lund, they have a large uh, experience in performing diet interventions. So we took 39 individuals and had a crossover design where they had a, either a barley kernel bread for three days or a white wheat bread for three days. They then had a two-week uh, washout and then had a crossover design. We got, uh, they had a meal test at each occasion and we had got a stool sample at each occasion. And if you look at these as populations, what you see is that uh, individuals after they have had a barley uh, kernel bread, they have a improved uh, glucose excursion after the breakfast or, and a re improved insulin excretion curve, so lower insulin, lower glucose after uh, the intervention. But then in the discussions with Anna and Inge, we said that the pr probably not everybody responds the same way. And of course, they, they do not. So we decided to divide them in the 10 worst responders and call them the non-responders. So nothing happens in these individuals after the intervention. 
And then we had the responders, the 10 that responded the best. And you see that here you have a really nice significant difference in both glucose and insulin. And we asked a, a, sim a simple question and asked just, is the microbiota different between the non-responders and the responders? And we addressed this by looking at the 16S rRNA gene, which is a marker for, for, for uh, phylogeny. And we don't, didn't really see much. Uh, so there's a slight but significant increase in the bacteroidetes test group in the responders after the barley kernel bread intervention. But if we then looked at the members of the, of the uh, bacteroidetes test uh, phylum, and the main genera is Prevotella and Bacteroides, we noted that the responders had a quite dramatic expansion of, of their ratio, so they had more Prevotella over Bacteroides compared to the non-responders. And also at baseline, there was a trend towards higher levels of uh, Prevotella Bacteroides ratio in the responders. So to test whether this was important, we did our favorite experiment. We do our transfers to germ-free mice. These are very expensive test tubes, but they work really beautifully. And we transferred the non-responded microbiota before uh, at the baseline or after barley kernel bread. Or we took the responder microbiota and did the same thing. And we found that if you transfer the non-responder microbiota, there's no difference in the before or after samples. But in the, these mice, it's noted that the responders after barley kernel bread had an improved glucose tolerance compared to, to, the, one, to the baseline samples. So we then went to, to really address what are the Prevotella members that are increased after the barley kernel bread. So we performed shotgun metagenomics on these same samples. And we found that the main Prevotella that was increased in the responders were Prevotella copri. So we then decided to see whether Prevotella copri could have some metabolically uh, advantageous effects. So we did an experiment where we took C57 mice and we, uh, and we treated them for one week with Prevotella and we performed a glucose tolerance test in either treated mice or control mice and we saw that the control mice had an imp impaired glucose tolerance compared to the treated mice. But if we instead did the experiment on a high-fat-fed mouse, where you don't have the fibers that are required for, for Prevotella, you didn't see any, uh, see any differences in the, blood, uh, in the glucose tolerance test, indicating that this is really a, micro, a Prevotella by diet effect. So I think this is also important when you really want to do interventions, that some in bacterial interventions may not work if you don't have the appropriate diet, which is something that we, I think we should keep in mind. So, Ted complained about the germ-free mouse, mouse model. This is our latest animal model. It's a wild brown bear. It's a little bit harder to work with. Uh, this is a study that was recently published. Uh, I think it's a really uh, cute little story, so I, I would like to share it with you. So it started by that uh, Olaf, uh, Olaf Herbert at the Örebro uh, University uh, Hospital contacted me and said that we have a really cool study together with the Scandinavian brown bear uh, project where we look at wild brown bears or free-ranging brown bears in the winter and in the summer. Would you like to participate? I said, that sounds really cool. Let's do it. So we basically they go out in the forest in the winter and they locate a bear den. They dig out the bear, they, they anesthetize it and they take a fecal sample from, from, from the rectum. They put on a tracer and then in the summer they go up with a helicopter and they shoot it to the same bear with a tranquilizer dart. Do you take a fecal sample? And then we look at the microbiota composition. So each dot here represents a wild brown bear. The blue ones are winter, the red ones are summer. We have more winter samples and then the summer samples because some of the summer bears didn't have a lot of stoop. Uh, some of the they some died actually, and some we couldn't get out of the forest, so we couldn't go in with a helicopter. But nevertheless, it's a clear separation in the microbial composition between winter and summer. So, is this important, and why would we ever think it would be important that the microbiota may play a role here? There's a paper published in Cell Metabolism that unfortunately were retracted uh, because of 
some of the molecular work in the final part of the paper uh, was, uh, was uh, falsified, it appears as. But the first part of the paper that is scientifically sound demonstrated in, in grizzly bears in captivity, they had a psych their, their insulin resistance cycled. So in the summer when they ate a lot and were fat, they actually had the best insulin sensitivity. And in the winter when they were uh, hibernating, they had the, the worst insulin sensitivity and were pretty lean. So we wondered whether the, germ uh, whether the microbiota could contribute to this. So we did the same ex experiment as we usually do. We take the germ-free mice, we colonize it with winter or summer bear microbiota. We look at fat gain, we do an intraperitoneal glucose tolerance test, and we kill the mice. So this was done uh, for four sets of animals, winter and summer. And we noted that the, the, summer bear, uh, the mice colonized with the summer microbiota gained more body weight, more fat gain, but they did that without affecting the, the blood glucose. So actually the winters, if anything, ha had uh, impaired glucose tolerance. We, unfortunately, we only harvested the epididymal uh, fat, and there was not really a striking difference there. It's significant, but it's not striking. So we don't know which fat depot that is increased by, by, the, uh, by the summer microbiota. And this is work from a very talented postdoc in the lab, Felix Sommer, who, who now has moved back to Germany. So if I should summarize my personal views, it's that the microbiota should be considered an important environmental factor that contributes to host metabolism and physiology. But we really need to move uh, from association to causality, identify mechanisms, and then start to perform human interventions to see whether what we find so nicely in mice and associations in humans, can this lead to new preventions and therapies. So there's a lot of people I shouldn't acknowledge, but the main players in this presentation have been Luis Manros Holm, who's been developing the insulin clamps in the germ-free mice. Um, Valentina Tremaroli together with Frederick Colson and Jens Nielsen uh, on the type 2 diabetes studies, and Valentina together with the team of surgeons and, and, and clinicians on, on uh, bariatric surgery. Petya together with Inger and Anne on, on, on the barley kernel pred project. Uh, Randy so set, helped to set up the vertical sleeve gastrectomies. And then Ole Fröbert and Felix Sommer on, on the on the Brown Bear Project. And I thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Frederick. And so we had a lo lot of data and new data on humans and on the bear. And so we are going to have lessons from this bear story for sure. So may I just ask a question, if I may, before I just let, let the floor. It's concerning this bear story. So you see clearly and in different models you have presented that when you transfer the microbiota from one situation or another to the germ-free mice, they differently gain uh, fat mass and weight. And there are some studies stating that it is maybe due to the fact that you change finally the, the metabolism of this microbiota in favor of sugar uh, use and so on by the gut microbes or uh, pro antioxidative capacity of the gut microbiota. What's your opinion about the link between the change in gut microbiota in terms of composition and the activity of the gut microbiota that we should take care to interpret the data? Oh, it's a very good question. And... Uh it's not every time we see differences in body fat. Sometimes we s see differences in glucose metabolism, but not body fat, uh, mm -hmm. or the opposite. So I think it depends. I think uh, one thing that we, we were a little bit worried about was that how well, because we get the samples, we put them in the freezer, how well does the frozen sample recapitulate what actually happens in vivo? So. Uh, Mohamed Tanvi Khan, who's a postdoc in the lab, has beautifully now showed, and we're about to write that up, that using bioreactors, that it really looks like we can maintain the structure and composition of the microbiota in the function together with its metabolic capacity. Mm -hmm. We then transfer it into the, to, to the mice, and I think it really depends on what you're going to do. So I don't think the same mechanism would be in play if you're going to do the basic surgery before and after transfers or to whether we do take from uh, metabolically healthy or unhealthy individuals, or if you take a summer or winter bear. Mm -hmm. I think all of these will have probably have different mechanisms. Our view at it at, at, at the moment is that the bear will probably be more an energy harvest thing. Uh, we don't have data on it, but that for me it's 
things like that. In, in the summer, they eat a lot of carbohydrates. They have an adapted microbiota that can take down this carbohydrate-rich diet. We feed the mice then a carbohydrate-rich diet. So I think that's that mm -hmm. adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, for experiments that we're currently doing with metformin, for example, I think it's a completely different mechanism. I think that's more shifting the function and structure of the microbiota for other signaling. We don't really know that yet, but we're working quite hard on that uh, and so forth. So it's, I think it's really context dependent. And I think that's, what, uh, that's how we should use these models is to ask more specific questions. Okay, so there was no one specific nope. uh, answer or pattern. Okay, thank you. Other questions in the audience? I'm sure. Oh, I can. Oh, yes, please, yeah. I'm just curious about the effect of physical activity. Talking about the bears, they are sleeping in winter and they are physically active in the summer. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, some studies of physical activity, but I, I haven't seen a really unanimous verdict on what's happening. Uh, I know that there are you know, a lot of thoughts about this, and I've seen some presentations also from uh, Sven Pettersson discussing muscle mass and so forth. So I think there is something to it, but I haven't seen well-prepared studies. And I think this is a particular field where there's a lot of confounders because people that do a lot of exercise usually eat better than non-exercised individuals. So I'm always afraid of how, how to do this. What you would like to do is take someone who doesn't exercise, have them eat the same, and then you know, make them run for a month, and then take another sample. Something like that. And I haven't seen that kind of study being done. I think that's what we, we need to see. Other questions? May I? May I? <laughs> so I, I really wondered in these beautiful data concerning the, the gastric bypass and the different techniques that, yes, for sure it works to decrease the, the body weight and sometimes it doesn't work if you don't have the FXR. The bile acid story is very complicated. You are an expert in, in, in the field. So when we look at the diversity of the bile acids which are produced, present in the, in the blood, in, in the gut, so what, once again, do you think that there are some key functions associated with the bile acid production, deconjugation, or things like that that could be more important to take into account in this story? Uh, I think so. Uh, I, I, I think that the bile acids are very interesting and very, you know, they play a role, I think. Uh, I think there's also studies now showing that the other bile acid receptor, TGR5, seems to be also important for the glucose modulating effects. The thing is that we tend to measure what we like, that we usually measure. So what you measure is about 16 bile acids, and the microbes probably produce 160 bile acids. So we tend to use the ones that we have protocols for. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if we in the future would say that uh, what really is important is a bile acid that we don't even know the nature of today mm -hmm. that is produced by the microbes. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes, one question over there. So I was just wondering, uh, bears have a special bile acid metabolism. Did you look into that at all with the urso deoxycarbic acid? Yeah, so we, we, we had the ideas, of course, that uh, tauro urso deoxycarbic acid would be an important player here, but we didn't see a big difference between summer and winter. So and you didn't measure it in the mice? With the new mice. So that we didn't see any differences in the mice. Okay. So that wasn't transferred. I think that's also potentially that it's such a prevalent uh, bile acid in the bears and it's not a major bile acid in, 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 in the mice. Okay, so if no questions, thanks very much for your excellent talk. Thank you. <laughs>